So let's move on to our next session, uh, which looks at a different aspect of uh, technology advancement, which has a huge impact on our industry. We, we turn our attention now to aviation. Not only will our, two, our next two speakers enlighten us on ways in which environmental sustainability and technology have been intertwined to continue to serve travel across the world, but of course we could not resist but to ask our speakers to give, it, to give us their views on aviation capacity as well. Robert Webb is General Counsel and Head of Risk at Rolls-Royce. He sits on the boards at the, of the London Stock Exchange and holding a Group Limited. And prior to Rolls-Royce, he was with British Airways and the BBC. And Jonathan Council was appointed uh, BA's Head of Environment in December 2007 with responsibility for developing and implementing BA's strategy on all issues relating to the environment, including climate change, air quality, noise and waste. Previously to this appointment, Jonathan was Head of T5 Development, where he was responsible for ensuring that the BA investment of $330 million in T5 was built on time, on budget, and on specification. This infrastructure was successfully completed and handed to the Heathrow operation in November 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert and Jonathan to the stage. What do we do, sit down? Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Good afternoon, everybody. What's really interesting about that BBC stuff is how digitization means you can roll out a pretty domestic brand worldwide very, very easily. And we've got some class brands in this country, really class. We've got the Queen. We've got, I would say, Rolls-Royce. Jonathan would say BA. We've got lots of them. And the fact that we are graphically small and sclerotic, so far as our arteries are concerned, doesn't mean that we can't do it, because we can take to the skies. However, Jonathan, Environment Hi. Director of British Airways, the airline we all love to hate. Indeed, uh, indeed. In the uh, uh, kind references to the opening of Terminal 5, which glossed over some events that some people remember, <laughs> um, we did hand it over. All in forgotten about. <laughs> yeah, we handed it over in November 2007, and again in December 2007, as I recall, and uh, <laughs> second time it went much better. Indeed. Jonathan, you're yes. charged with um, environment and BA. Where yes. do you want to start? Is it a good um, story? I think, uh, well, before we, I'll just get the clicker here to, um, I just want to demonstrate that Rob is uh, 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 very qualified to talk about um, the environment. This is a picture of Rob at a, a wind farm back in uh, 2008, I think that was, wasn't it? And that was a wind farm that uh, uh, was funded by British Airways customers. And we took a joint trip. Was, I have to say, it was a trip of a lifetime. Um, I learned more about uh, Rob, I think, than the wind farms. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh <laughs> I didn't think it existed. Uh, we were collecting all this money from customers for a wind farm in Inner Mongolia. And I thought it just must have been a mafia scam. So I went out, so I went out there, and there it was. And it was, I think, uh, what is it, minus 30 degrees there? Yeah. The mistake we made, we went in January. So if you want to go to Mongolia, it's a beautiful country, don't go in January. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what I want to talk about is really um, uh, climate change. Obviously, the aviation industry uh, is a big producer of CO2. We recognize that, and we recognize that we have to play our full part in, in reducing those CO2 emissions. We work uh, uh, collaboratively uh, as an industry, and uh, most importantly, uh, we have set these targets in terms of reducing our CO2 emissions. So improving our fuel efficiency to 2020, but much more importantly, it's the absolute targets from 2020 and 2050. So aviation emissions to peak in 2020, uh, and then uh, a trajectory to achieve a 50% reduction in net emissions by 2050. And I think I'm right in saying we are the only global industry that has a, a, a agreed target on CO2 emissions. Are you going to make it? Uh, we, uh, I have to say, we actually did set the, t set the target before we figured out how we're going to do it. Um, but let me just talk about some of the things that we're doing. Now, I know it's a bit late on a Friday to put up a chart like this, but um, so bear with me because it all hangs off this chart. It's all, all the are we going to make it questions. Do you promise that if we work at this chart, 
we won't have to work at any of the others. The other ones, they're pretty pictures. This is the hardest one. Okay. Once you get through this one, the rest is easy. You easy. happy to have a go at this? Anyone have a go at this? So it's an easy chart. Basically, says the top line, the red bit, says if we did nothing, that's what was what would happen to uh, aviation emissions. So essentially, they would increase by two and a half times. Uh, clearly, that's not acceptable. Uh, so the different bars there show the various contributions that we're making to achieve that 50% target. So the green is operational efficiencies, and I can talk a bit about some of the things we're doing there. Uh, but the biggest component is new technology, aircraft and uh, engines, and uh, happy to say uh, Rolls-Royce engines, of course. Uh, so uh, technology that exists today, so A380s and 787s, and technology that's on the drawing board uh, uh, and will be uh, implemented from, say, 2030 onwards. Uh, biofuels. We are very excited about biofuels. That's the purple bar there. And there have been over 2,000 flight tests in the airline industry on biofuels. So we know it technically works. We've now got to prove it uh, commercially. Uh, but you'll notice that doesn't get us to the 50% reduction. It just gets us back to 2000, 2005 levels of emissions by 2050. We need to rely on market-based measures, uh, uh, carbon trading. That is the preferred instrument that we're looking at. Uh, and that's why we work uh, very closely with our industry association, IATA, and with ICAO to try and develop a global framework to help us meet this overall target to reduce our emissions. And the important thing about carbon trading, putting a price on carbon, is it provides a price incentive to accelerate all of those technology options uh, above. Yeah. So it helps improve the business case on that uh, low carbon technology. Rolls are investing a billion pounds a year in research and development, and two-thirds of that is on emission reduction. It's the focus of everything for reasons of cost, for reasons of environment, for reasons of carbon trading, and for reasons of legislation. But it's a huge sum for an individual company to be spending, and I think that just shows really how seriously they take it. Should I talk about some of the individual components there? Yeah. Just to give yeah. a bit of a flavor. The first thing I'd like to say is that people are, are we, this is the measure that we use for carbon efficiency. Grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer. It's an industry standard. And of course, it's the, it's the uh, uh, um, uh, factor that we use when we buy a car. Now, I haven't, uh, I'm not picking on the BMW. This is pretty typical for any large SUV. 233 grams of uh, CO2 per kilometer. The best out there at the moment is 89 grams of CO2 per kilometer. BA today is 103 grams of CO2 per passenger kilometer. Our target is to get to 83 grams. So you can see that flying is actually a relatively carbon efficient activity. Of course, the difference is you don't tend to drive 10,000 kilometers at a time. Um, so it's the distance that makes a, but uh, in terms of carbon efficiency, it, it, it is up there. And we at BA, we have a whole bunch of activities. We have a dedicated team looking at improving uh, uh, our carbon efficiency. This is a 777. You won't, won't be able to see a lot of the detail there, but it's about really flying sh uh, uh, smarter, shorter, lighter. So we have a big focus on weight. But one particular project that I'm really excited about is this Go Faster Paint project. Okay, cool. So we actually coat, uh, we'll at, we've coated one of our A3118s, which flies the direct route from London City Airport to, to Newark. Uh, the coating's been on there for a year. It's literally a molecule thick. So literally, a jam jar of this stuff will cover the whole plane. But it, it, it really smooths out the surface. Uh, and we got a 0.4% fuel saving. That doesn't sound a lot. But across, uh, across our entire fleet, that's 15 million pounds a year saving. So we're currently trialing that on our, our Boeing 777s uh, to prove that it works on wider, uh, wide body aircraft as well. And uh, you know, we're looking forward to rolling that out across the, uh, the entire fleet. There's, a, there's another particular project I must mention is called Toilet Pipe Descaling. I know it sounds a bit, uh, a bit dodgy to be talking that before the threshold, I guess, but uh, uh, we, we saw on our 747s that there's quite a lot of scale build-up, uh, particularly because the UK... How much detail do you want, do you want to go oh, into? Yeah, so well, I, I, did, uh, I, I actually did uh, I didn't bring the picture because that was getting a, a bit too graphic, right. but uh, it's lime scale. It's lime right. scale, right. yeah. And uh, we worked out on a 747, there's over 100 kilograms of lime scale buildup in these pipes. And just running through this cleansing agent, we're taking off 100 kilograms of weight. So uh, now we did a press release of our general, uh, our fuel efficiency program earlier this year. The one thing that got picked up across the whole globe was the toilet pipe. I spent two days in interviews with journalists from all over the world. That's all they wanted to know about. So there's something for us in terms of learning what the media get interested. If you weave the word toilet in, you 
you're going to get their attention, but I guess you need to be careful on that one. Have you made any political progress with my favorite on this, which is, I want duty-free to be abolished, but if it's not abolished, I want it to be bought at the point of arrival, not the point of departure, so that every passenger doesn't carry three heavy bottles of vodka around the world in order to drink them in his hotel room when he gets back to King's Cross or wherever it is. If you could buy it at the point of arrival, the savings would be enorm enormous. What's stopping that? Yeah, well, basically, it, it's, uh, mm, it, it's, it's the mix that the, the passengers demand. Many want to actually, for when they're going on holiday, uh, if we could segregate those items that they don't want on holiday, and then we could deliver to their... But uh, technology is enabling us to do that, and I think uh, uh, smarter supply chains, um, uh, I think, are going to be an enabler to be able to... So the idea is you order on flight, and then you can determine, do I want it now, or do I want it delivered to my home? So that's a very real possibility. And as a good example of how politicians can't do anything even when they all agree, um, would you like to tell us how the single sky is going on and whether yeah. we're going to be able to route directly from place to place within Europe or whether we're going to have to go on zigzagging around France and Switzerland and everywhere else? Yeah, so single European skies. It's, it's the project that's always described. It's always 10 years away. Um, and uh, it is frustrating because... Uh, so basically, in Europe, we have 36 air traffic control authorities. So some of the routings across Europe, I mean, the, you'd think that an aircraft would be able to fly a direct routing. You would be uh, uh, pretty shocked, I think, to see some, uh, some of those routings. So the overall saving in carbon, if we went to best practice uh, uh, air traffic control, single European skies, is 12% of the industry's carbon. So a massive prize. Uh, it's all down to political will. We need to get down from 36 uh, ATCs down to half a dozen. Uh, and uh, there is a program in place called Functional Air Blocks. We're hoping to see those in by December of this year. But of course, some countries have to give up their sovereignty of their airspace, because currently every country is holding on to it. So it is about political will. We're hoping that the carbon agenda is going to you know, help, help uh, uh, get through some of that inertia that we're currently facing. But it's the same thing that's holding up consolidation in your industry generally that all these airlines and this airspace and these ATC facilities are all viewed as national assets and Absolutely. national icons. Absolutely. And it's just ridiculous, isn't yeah. it? I mean, you don't have to build anything. You could do it with the stroke of 26 pence yeah, and exactly. save 12%. The prize is there for the taking. And that's why, you know, as an industry, in fact, for all of us to constantly get that message across to governments that they're, you know, we have to do this. The efficiency gains are too great to, to miss. Thank you. Should I talk a bit about aircraft? Yeah, I, go I on. can give a plug for Rolls Royce. Yeah, if I, do, yeah. I think so the audience would expect that. <laughs> John Smith so, on the as, BBC. As, they such yeah. a, <laughs> as they're such a big chunk, if you go back to that chart, 50% of our saving is down to the new technology. This is the A380, so British Airways gets its first of its 12 A380s uh, uh, in about uh, 12 months' time. 20% more fuel efficient than the 747s it replaces. Uh, and this has got the Trent 900 Rolls Royce engine on That's it. That's one of ours. Uh, and then the Dreamliner, the Boeing Dreamliner. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware, this aircraft is made of carbon fiber. It's the first aircraft where the fuselage is fully made of carbon fiber. This aircraft is uh, 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 in for BA's fleet. Again, we're receiving 24 of these. The first one uh, mid next year is 30% more fuel efficient than the aircraft uh, it replaces. So these are going to make a big difference to our uh, helping us meet our carbon reduction targets. And they're similar in noise, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, noise, uh, very impressive, particularly on arrivals. Uh, so both the 787 and the A380 have one quarter, one quarter the noise footprint of a 747. I mean, 747, to be fair, you know, it's 30-year-old technology. Uh, and, uh, and so it's not surprising that we've moved a long way. But one quarter the noise footprint. We actually get residents uh, uh, from the uh, sort of Heathrow area writing in to say they're glad that uh, some of these aircraft are start now starting to arrive at Heathrow because they're noticing that they are noticeably quieter. So great on noise as well. Thank you. Shall I talk about next generation just briefly? Because, uh, again, there's, uh, there's quite a lot going on there. So this is, this, this is we're into Star this Trek. Is, this is Star Trek stuff. But this is going to yeah. happen, isn't it? Not the one on the right, but the one on the left is going to happen. Yeah, so this is open rotor engine. So basically like a jet engine without, uh, without a cowling. So it's a lot lighter. 
Uh, and we expect these to be flying from 2025 20, onwards, 30% more efficient. You're going to get the residents of Notting Hill writing to you again, I think, though, because there's no cowling to shut the noise in. Yeah, there's well, it's, it's, it, now it's interesting. It is quieter than today's engines, but it's not as quiet as it could be if you went to the next generation of cowled engines. But I think you're right, Rob. The difference is this makes a different sort of noise. So it's called a buzzer. <laughs> How does that sound? Can I do a bit like of mis <laughs> market research on that? This, yeah. is, this, is, this is like a wrong snow argument. I yes, can tell. Yeah, it is. Right. Yes. It's sort of purrs. You're going to love it. We'll leave yeah. it to the engine yeah. companies to sell this one. <laughs> um, and then the next sort of leap forward is this is the blended wing body. This is the most aerodynamically efficient, efficient shape of a plane. Um, uh, and, and the question, and again, 30% more efficient than the most efficient aircraft that are available today. The view is we could be flying these again by 2030. Uh, any, anyone recognizes sort of B-2 bomber? These are already flying in military applications, so very real prospect that we'll be flying these uh, 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 in civil aviation. Thank you. Do you want to finish off by interviewing me on airport policy, or would you like to say a bit about Selena? And what's I should do there? a little bit on biofuels, then we'll talk about... Yeah, so do, do as biofuels. I say, biofuels. So I say we're very excited about biofuels. There's been over 2,000 tests. Uh, this is a project that we're working with uh, a technology company called Selena. Um, it'll be based in the east of London, a bit of artistic license. Uh, this is what it looks like. I don't think there are many places like that in the east of London, but there you go. Um, uh, and it's incredible technology. It takes domestic waste, industrial waste, agricultural waste, and it converts it into jet fuel. Now, technology has been around for a long time. It's called fisher trops technology and, and gasification technology. Uh, the issue, it, it is expensive. And the reason it's attractive here in the UK is because of landfill tax. So we have a very expensive landfill tax here. It's about 50 pounds per tonne, uh, and it's increasing to up to 80 pounds a tonne in the next three years. So uh, uh, local authorities are desperately looking for places to get rid of their waste. So therefore, the feedstock for this will be free. In fact, they'll probably pay us to take their hands off their hands. So, um, so that's what makes the economics of this work. The original name for the project was the Carbon Reclamation and Processing Plant, which I thought was a fantastic name. But our marketing guys had, some, had an issue with the, uh, the uh, acronym there. It says what it is, really. You yes. Know, so. yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, you did well with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a bit of a theme to your presentation. Oh, there is, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're feeling okay. I am fine, yeah. thank oh. you. <laughs> Should we talk about aviation policy? Let's talk about aviation policy. Because I guess the other, other big issue that was alluded to, I guess, in one of the early uh, uh, presentations this morning from Kit, is, is uh, airport capacity. Clearly, the UK is suffering from a lack of, uh, of airport capacity. We welcome the government uh, aviation consultation framework, um, uh, and we're hoping it'll, uh, it'll bring the, the right answer. So yeah, I'd be interested in your perspective on that, Rob. You welcome it because you have to, because um, that's what you say when a democratic government produces a consultation paper. Uh, but some of the realities are really pretty different. Um, there are quite a lot of people, including opinion formers, who don't know what a hub airport is. They think it's just a busy place, or central, or an airport in a capital. A hub airport is a term of art, and it's a place where you bring passengers in in order to distribute them, typically on long-haul routes, to other places. You collect them and send them out. And by virtue of collecting them, you can, of course, fly to more places than you could if you hadn't collected them, because more routes are economically viable. When I was at BA, which I was for a bit, we took our domestic destinations to Heathrow down from 16 to 8. And part of my job was to go to the citizens of Guernsey and Jersey and Belfast and Inverness and tell them that they couldn't fly to Heathrow anymore because we wanted the slots. Why did we want the slots? Because in the airline business, frequency is the key driver. If you're 10 a day to New York and your competitor is 12 a day, you lose the competition at the end of the day. You don't just lose the two, you lose the momentum. So we had to pillage all the short haul slots for long haul. And now that I'm not there, I can say that my view is that BA should give up being a network carrier. It should give up short haul entirely. It should flip itself into a big virgin and just fly. Um, long haul point to point from Heathrow like Virgin does, because the market is so big and the short haul is so unprofitable. But nobody wants to hear that argument 
because it's a very much anti-UK argument and would be opposed by the mayors of Inverness, Belfast, and everybody else, Manchester, because it cuts them off from the network that's provided out of Heathrow. And it's that hub concept that we're trying to preserve. The trouble is, if you've got only two runways, you're very limited in what you can do. And we also have a competition authority which defines markets by reference to out-of-date national constructs. So they define Heathrow as a market and say you've got 45% of the slots at Heathrow, that's quite enough, thank you, any more than that and you'll be dominant. The idea that we can be dominant uh, across the North Atlantic, for example, is just for the birds. It was probably not true at the time of the American War of Independence, but it's certainly not true now. <laughs> They've done much better in infrastructure terms, although not in culture terms, than we have. Uh, so uh, that's the sort of problem we face. And it's all very well to go back to talking about um, Maplin uh, and the airport in the Thames and Boris Island and so on. That can't happen within the planning life of an airline. Mm -hmm. The industry loses money hand over fist. Um, we don't really manage to build anything in the UK. We have, during the last 15 years, built Boris's bus lane down the M4 and then abandoned it. And that's about it until we get Crossrail. So our history building this stuff for loss-making industries is not good. So I'm not interested in Boris's island. Right. Uh, right. Because it won't be built until you're dead, let alone yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's before we even talk about the price, I think. So yeah. I've heard price quotes for Boris Island of 50 billion pounds, where, you know, third runway, 10 billion pounds. So, um, and I guess every time, I guess the key issue of our, uh, that we're concerned with is just the delay, the constant delay. So we're losing out competitively to our European hubs, and every month of delay, it's getting worse and worse. I mean, do, uh, do, you, do you think that's well understood? You've got, to, you've got to enjoy that. Uh, England is the best debating chamber that the world has produced. Mm. Uh, we're entirely without the ability to act, um, entirely without the ability to execute. But if you want a discussion, whether it's about airports or politics or press freedom, mm. this is mm. the place to come. Yep. It's unbeatable. Yeah. I would advertise, guys, if I were you, on that basis. I yeah. wouldn't <laughs> bother with much else. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I wish they could just make one exception, though. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, yeah. the people won't be able to get here yes, to, to that's enjoy true. that. Yeah. That's true. And, uh, I mean, just to, to quote some stats, I mean, uh, so two runways, obviously, Heathrow, Paris has four, uh, sorry, five. Frankfurt has four. Schiphol, has, Schiphol and Amsterdam has five. And I believe that Schiphol are planning a sixth runway on the basis that we're not building a third because they can use it to justify the business case. Uh, and I know that the, uh, the chief executives of those three airports have been celebrating yeah. ever since we announced uh, the cancellation of the third And Frankfurt runway. has four runways, and Frankfurt is the same size as Yeovil without the nightlife. I mean, it's <laughs> just absolutely <laughs> frightful. Uh, we can't compete against that for very long. Right. Do you know, that's twice today Frankfurt's come in for a bit of yeah. background, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, good luck to them, eh? Yeah. 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 Uh, They've exactly. got to do something over there. Exactly. Build a runway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do, you, what do you think should be the uh, very clear message to, uh, to government on this one? The message to government across the whole, well, it doesn't matter if you're aviation or what it is, is listen to industry. Don't forget the wealth creators. We know you're elected by consumers. Uh, we know that it's one man, we vote, one vote. We know that you have to give in to various demands of consumers. But there are big, big wealth creators out there. You're one, we're one. There are mm. more than 100 of them in this room. And somehow they've got to get the idea that wealth doesn't create itself. Mm. Um, mm. We've been so prosperous for so long that we've sort of forgotten it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. if you go to the former Yugoslavia, they'll remind you of it pretty quickly. Yeah. So we're hoping out of this next, I guess, consultation, phase of consultation, we know there's a political issue around the third runway, so undertake a study of all the options, but for goodness sake, make a decision so that we can get competitive um, and bring people to this, uh, this wonderful country. And actually, I have to, there was a, a, one story, it comes back to when we were in China, uh, before we opened it up to questions. Uh, do you remember, it was uh, at the time that the third runway was approved by the, the uh, 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 then Labour government, and our Chinese colleagues said to us, basically, we've looked at the English press, and every headline is about a runway. 
And we said, is this, it can't be one runway, surely all this fuss. And we said, no, no, it is, it's a big, uh, it's a big issue, there's a lot of debate going on. And they said, when are you going to get it? And we said, well, 2025, we hope. And they just did this quick mental calculation, you remember, they said, we're going to build 70 airports by 2020. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. that kind of, kind of put us in our box, didn't it? Yeah, right, fair enough. What gave me the sense of the speed of it, we were staying in a large industrial city, tower blocks everywhere, and I was with my wife, and it was 9 o'clock at night, and she said to the sort of uniform concierge figure, is it safe for me to go out shopping? And he looked at her and said, yes, of course it is, madam. This is a city. He was thinking of the danger of bears and other stuff. <laughs> and uh, it was... Uh, it, it was just, and I suddenly realized that, that you know, this had all happened in the last 15 years, and there were sort of <laughs> lions and tigers sitting outside the boundaries. Strange place. Should we uh, a open red up light. some questions? Yeah, questions of anything you want. Yeah, we've got, I think, a few minutes. So. What's our timetable, Jonathan? Do you want questions? Do you want us to get off? Off or? Yeah. <laughs> one, or two, right. one or two questions we're allowed, so any, any questions? Uh, good afternoon, Simon Calder from The Independent, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, this one's for you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, during the airport debate, why have we heard less uh, or nothing, effectively, about mixed mode? And I'm sure that uh, uh, everybody here knows that's using both runways for simultaneous landings and takeoffs, which increases capacity by a third, approximately, just by turning on a switch. You don't need to build anything new at all. Um, why, why is there not more pressure from the industry for that? Which Let me give, give you the glib time. answer, and then Jonathan will give you the factual answer. The glib answer is that if you believe the decision to not build a third runway had something to do with the population of West London, then mess, m mixed mode's not going to happen either. What's the real answer? Yeah, no, absolutely right. I mean, we, we are pushing uh, for... No, it's the easy option to improve the capacity and resilience of Heathrow. And boy, we need that. It's 99% full. It doesn't take a lot, as we all know, uh, for us to get into disruption. Uh, but uh, in fact, when the consultation was uh, first taken place, uh, uh, mixed mode is more unpopular than the third runway. So a lot of residents around the airport actually value this, uh, this alternation. And of course, you know, the fact that they can plan their lives around the, at 3 o'clock each day we're going to switch runways, and then therefore they can do things outside. So it is actually a very real issue for the, for the residents around the airport. Think local and shrink. Um, one very quick one. What's the um, opportunity for regional airports? Is there a, uh, a growth scenario in the future that would make them much more popular? The question was, uh, what is the growth scene for regional airports? Are we going to see any changes that are going to make them much more popular? I would answer that, that in terms of point-to-point -point traffic, yes. As Europe gets denser and denser, uh, as people fly around it more, as land transport becomes more difficult, the point-to-point -point market will grow. Uh, and as the great innovators like the Ryanairs and so on start to discover more destinations, they'll fly from those places. But it's very hard to see um, a hub developing in the UK. I mean, Manchester tried with its second runway, but um, they only built the ship canal because they didn't want Liverpool to get ahead of them. Uh, and there's an <laughs> element of... Uh, civic pride yeah, in the sort of Mancunian makeup. It's my hometown, which they can go on building runways on the if we build it, they will come mantra until one day someone comes and grasses them over again. And, and that's just reinforcing that. That's absolutely right. I think uh, regional airports can serve growth in point-to-point -point markets. The UK can only support one globally competitive hub you, because the way hubs work is you have a critical mass of flights. You create that connectivity. And this notion of vir virtual hubs or split hubs, I mean, there are graveyards full of, 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 of cities that have tried the split hub concept. The, probably the best example is Tokyo. You know, if you talk to anybody in Japan around the, you know, Narita Hanada experience, uh, terrible. British Airways' own experience, we tried to uh, create a hub at Gat Gatwick that cost us hundreds of millions of pounds, and it didn't work. You can only do it, really, at one airport. Now, obviously, we favor Heathrow, but we welcome a study that says, look at all the options, but please... Do it quickly so we can make a decision fast. You want us off? One more. I'll try with a low, lower voice. Uh, uh, you, I think in some ways you were asked that question. What about uh, Gatwick and uh, Stansted? I won't mention Luton, but uh, what about those other two? 
Well, well, sorry. You can't get enough people into a single runway to get the momentum to get them out again, particularly if you're trying to run it off two terminals. So you never get critical mass. A hub doesn't mean coming in on Tuesday and flying where you want to go on Wednesday. It's got to be done um, within 90 minutes, 120 minutes, something like that. So absolutely that, and I know there's... Uh, so BA tried that in the sort of 80s. Uh, the latest proposal is called Heathwick, so put a high-speed rail link between Gatwick and, and Heathrow. But as Rob says, it's minimum connect times. You really, I mean, to be world class, you've got to get down to 45 yep. minutes. You know, 60 minutes is about, uh, yeah. Mm. And with the best will in the world, you're still looking at an hour and a half, two hours with a high speed rail link between the two, so it won't work. You can explain Heathwick to the Chinese. I will. You can go on your own this time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed.